Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam with Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And hey, if you haven't seen it before, there's a merch store and a Patreon for this channel in the links below. Thank you guys, that's awesome. Now, before we get started on this video, I do have one last thing I need to address. I got a comment or received a comment from somebody probably about a month or so ago that I really do need to finally address. I am very sorry that it took me this long to respond to your comment, but hey, I'm doing it now. And the comment was left by one of the younger fans of my channel, and his name is Josiah. Hi, Josiah. Thank you for being a member of the Historic Travels community. And he asked me if I'm ever going to cover a ship known as the Andrea Doria. Well, yes, I'm going to cover it very soon. Thank you so much for your comment, and I'm sorry it took me this long to respond to it. But hey, thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of the Historic Travels community. All right, everybody. So hey, this is the video that you all have been waiting for. In this video, we are finally going to talk about one of the most recent maritime disasters to strike the world. And honestly, the story of this disaster is mind-blowing. It's got a lot of twists and turns. And honestly, it leaves you scratching your head as to how something like this could ever happen. So what am I talking about here? Well, in today's video, we're going to be talking about the sinking of the Costa Concordia. The Costa Concordia was a massive modern-day cruise ship that was designed to carry passengers and crew to various destinations all across the world. Now, the ship was owned by the Costa Corporation, which is also part of the Carnival Corporation, the same company that operates Carnival Cruise Lines, the biggest cruise company in the entire world. The Costa Corporation ordered the Costa Concordia in 2004, with construction of the ship finishing in 2006, and this was also the same year the ship entered service. And this ship was designed to be the very best that the Costa Corporation could offer. Massive atrium, tons of pools, tons of restaurants, bars, casinos, day spa, you name it, this ship had it. And this ship could carry roughly 3,700 passengers, as long as another 1,000 crew members to help care for all the passengers. This truly was a massive modern-day cruise ship and she was a very successful cruise ship for the several years that this vessel was in service. The Costa Concordia's captain was this man, Francesco Scatino. He had been the captain of this ship since 2006, and he had actually worked for the Costa Company since 2002. So he had a ton of experience with the Costa Concordia, and it's safe to say he knew the ship pretty well. Now, even though I said the Costa Concordia could sail all over the world, she was primarily only used for the Italian market and sailed in the Mediterranean. And in this area, she was an incredibly successful cruise ship. She carried hundreds of thousands of passengers over her six years of service. And overall, the public really liked and really enjoyed this vessel. However, everything changed in January of 2012, when something would happen to the Costa Concordia that would change the lives of everyone on board this ship forever. On January the 11th, 2012, the Costa Concordia was preparing to head out on a seven-day voyage that would take it all around the Mediterranean. It would leave from the city of Calgary, and then it would head over to Palamaru, Sicily. And then from there, it would head up to Civita Vecchia. And then, yeah, it would just continue on this course, taking it to several cities and different countries all around the Mediterranean Sea. Now, during the beginning part of this voyage, things proceeded pretty smoothly on board the Costa Concordia. She made it to Sicily without any problems. She proceeded from there up to Sevasta Vecchia without any issues. Now, you can take this as a bad sign or not. It's up to you. But when the ship made it to Sevasta Vecchia, it was Friday the 13th. Ugh, bad day. Actually, it really was a bad day. So, as the ship left that city, that evening, as the ship was proceeding en route to its next destination, the crew decided to do something a little bit different. They decided to divert the Costa Concordia's course to head over to another island called the Island of Giglio. And they weren't going to stop the ship there, but essentially what they were going to do was do what's known as a sail by salute, where a ship comes in pretty close to an island and it's just kind of like a, kind of like a show for the people on the island to see this massive ship cruise by. It's a pretty cool event for all the passengers on board the ship to see. It was just a, I guess you could consider it kind of like a stunt or something, you know, just something the crew on board the Costa Concordia wanted to do to pay respect to the island of Julio and give the passengers on board the Costa Concordia a cool thing to see during that night of the voyage. Now, when I say it was the crew's decision to do this sail by salute of the island of Julio, this is more or less true. However, the decision to actually do this sail by salute rests mostly with the captain. It's just this wasn't that uncommon of a thing for him, so the crew didn't protest and they all just kind of went along with it. Now, doing a sail by salute isn't really that uncommon. A lot of ships during the time and still now do this. And you see, the island of Julio isn't that far off of the Costa Concordia's original route. As you can see from this 
map. As soon as the coast of Concordia left Czechoslovakia, the gray line you see is the coast of Concordia's original route, and the little red line you see at the top of this map shows the improvised route that the coast of Concordia took to the island of Julia. So as you can see, it really isn't that far out of their way for the coast of Concordia just to do a quick sail by of this island. And another thing, the coast of Concordia had done sail by salutes of this island in the past. In this footage you see right here, this video was shot in August of the previous year, so August 2011. And you can plain as day see the coast of Concordia sailing by doing a sail by salute of the island of Julia, just like what the crew planned to do on this crossing in January of 2012. Now here's where things start to go wrong on board the coast of Concordia. You see, to do this sail by salute, the captain was looking for a big show. You know, he was wanting to really impress the passengers on board the ship. So he was going to try to bring in the coast of Concordia as close to the shoreline as possible. He was actually shooting to get the coast of Concordia within 1500 feet of the island shore, which is extremely close and very dangerous for a massive cruise ship to get to an island. Like very, very dangerous. Now. As they were doing this, you know, getting the ship close to the island, the helmsman, the person who is driving the coast of Concordia, he didn't speak English or Italian very well, which was the two prominent languages on board the ship. So there was a miscommunication between him and the ship's captain, and he ended up bringing the ship much closer to the island shoreline than what they had originally planned. Now, it didn't take the bridge officers very long to realize the mistake of the helmsman, and they quickly ordered the Costa Concordia to turn hard to starboard in an attempt to turn the Costa Concordia away from the rocks and get it to a safe distance once again from the island of Julia. However, at this point, it was too late. The Costa Concordia was traveling at roughly 16 knots, so this hindered the vessel's ability to turn due to the increased speed and how massive this vessel is. And at around 9.45 p.m. on Friday the 13th of 2012, the Costa Concordia hit a massive rock just off the coastline of the island of Julio, puncturing several watertight compartments and leaving a massive boulder in the hull of the ship. Now, anytime you have a situation where you have a vessel come into contact with something and it actually punctures the ship's hull and allows water to come in, that's a very serious situation. However, I would argue that what happened to the Costa Concordia was actually much worse. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, in order to properly explain, let's compare the impact that the Costa Concordia had with the rock with the impact that the Titanic had with the iceberg. Now, on paper, it doesn't really seem like there's much of a comparison, but honestly, still by comparing the two, it can teach us a few things. So, when the Titanic struck the iceberg, the iceberg damaged roughly 300 feet of the Titanic's hull, from front of the ship all the way to aft of the first funnel, and it damaged roughly 300 feet of the Titanic's hull. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the iceberg did not cause a massive rip right along the Titanic's hull. It wasn't like one massive hole. It was essentially a bunch of small little gashes all along the Titanic's hull that allowed seawater to come in. Now, when the iceberg, when the Titanic hit the iceberg, it opened up roughly six of the Titanic's watertight compartments. Now, let's jump over to the Concordia for a second. And just for reference material, just pretend that in this situation, my Titanic model is the Costa Concordia. When the Costa Concordia hit the rock, it only damaged 160 to 170 feet of the Costa Concordia's hull, opening up three of the Costa Concordia's seven watertight compartments. Still a very serious situation, but it wasn't as bad as the Titanic's impact. However, this damage would in fact sink the ship. You know, with three compartments out of the seven gone, the Costa Concordia could not stay afloat. I believe the Concordia could handle two watertight compartments breach, but don't quote me on that. But what makes this even worse is where the Coast of Concordia got opened up by the rock. You see, on the Coast of Concordia, the rock opened up roughly 160 to 170 feet of the hull as one big gash, and it was located right around midship to aft. So 160 to 170 feet of this section of the Concordia was opened up by the rock. As I said, very serious, and the ship would inevitably sink. But what made it worse was the actual compartments that were opened up by the rock. You see, the rock opened up the hull right around the area where the Costa Concordia's engine room was. So that meant that within 30 seconds of the Concordia hitting that rock, the ship lost all electrical power. They lost all the ability to be able to control the ship, so they couldn't use the ship's engines. They couldn't adjust the ship's rudder. I mean, and the power went out almost immediately. Now, the Concordia did have an emergency backup system, which did kick in. But still, because of where the Concordia hit the rock, it severely limited the crew's ability to be able to deal with the incoming water. 
And if we jump back to the Titanic for a second, even though the Titanic had a much larger area of the iceberg, or I'm sorry, a much larger area of the hull of the ship opened up by the iceberg, the water was contained to the front of the ship, nowhere near where the Titanic's engine room and the power generator and all that stuff was. So even though the ship was sinking, the Titanic was still able to keep basic infrastructure or basic systems on the ship going, which really did help the crew when it came to evacuating the Titanic. However, the Costa Concordia's crew did not have that luxury. The rock had opened up the hull of the ship in the worst possible area. Now, at the time of the impact, several of the Costa Concordia's passengers were still enjoying a very late dinner. Now, in this dining room, it was located in a deeper section of the Concordia, closer to where the impact was. And these passengers felt the impact pretty strongly. Several passengers said that things actually fell from shelves or upper levels of this room and actually fell on their heads. So, in this room... It was very chaotic for the passengers and crew because the passengers were confused about what happened, the crew in this room didn't know what happened, and they were doing their best to keep the passengers calm. However, in this section of the ship, people were starting to panic. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to play you some of this clip with audio so you can get a basic understanding of the situation in this room just after the impact. <laughs> Now, around five minutes after the Costa Concordia hit the rock, the bridge crew did make an announcement to the entire ship, letting all the passengers know that what they were experiencing was just a power failure. It wasn't any danger to the ship and that they were completely okay and that the uh, technicians on board the Concordia were working to resolve the problem. Now, if I would have been a passenger on board the Concordia and I felt the ship shake and vibrate, saw things fall from the shelves, and then the power goes out, yeah, I wouldn't believe them if they made that announcement. I would really believe that we had hit something or that something was going on. What about all of you guys? Would you guys think that something more serious was going on if you felt the ship vibrate, saw things fall from the shelves, and then the bridge crew just says that you're just experiencing a power failure? What would you guys think? Maybe it's just me being paranoid because of how fascinated I've been with a certain other vessel throughout the course of my life. Now, at roughly 10 p.m. or so, Captain Scatino was on the phone with the Costa Corporation, letting them know about the situation that was currently unfolding on board his ship. Now, also around this time, one of the Costa Concordia's engineers came up from the engine room up to the bridge to let the bridge crew know about the situation they were currently facing deep within the Costa Concordia. He told them that the boulder had, in fact, opened up three compartments, uh, three watertight compartments to be exact, on the Costa Concordia's port side. However, water was beginning to spill over into a fourth watertight compartment and the Costa Concordia was beginning to list a port. Yet, even with all of this going on, the bridge crew on board the Costa Concordia did not order an abandoned ship, and did not tell the passengers to begin making their way to the lifeboats. Now, if I would have been the captain of the Costa Concordia, and I had just learned all of this, this would have been the time that I would have begun the evacuation of the ship. I mean, think about it. You've got three compartments flooded. You've got a fourth compartment starting to flood. On top of that, the ship is listing the port. And if you take a look at this map, this map shows the Costa Concordia's route that night. The ship is beginning to drift further and further out to sea. So, yeah, the situation is getting really serious on board the Concordia, and if you don't start the evacuation soon, you run the risk of this ship capsizing and taking everyone with it. Now, at this point, the crew on board the Costa Concordia get a little bit lucky. You see, even though the ship was starting to drift further out to sea, there was a very strong wind that night blowing to the west, and this wind actually caught the Concordia and began pushing it back towards the island of Julio. And another factor that actually helped this process was due to the fact that the very last command that the ship's crew put into the ship's helm before they lost all helm control was to turn the ship's rudder hard to starboard. So the rudder remained in this position even though they had lost all ability to control it. And this actually helped the Costa Concordia turn with the wind and allowed the wind to push the Costa Concordia further towards the shoreline. So really, it was this miracle that actually prevented the disaster of the Costa Concordia from being a lot worse than it otherwise would have been if the ship had continued to drift further out to sea. Now the wind would eventually push the Costa Concordia all the way back up to the shoreline of the island of Julio, and the vessel would essentially beach itself not too far off the coast. And it was this miracle that would keep the Costa Concordia from sinking all the way. The vessel would founder and it would sink about halfway-ish. But due to the fact that the vessel was right off the coastline, the ship would not completely founder and a lot of lives would end up being saved. 
Now, before we go more into that, I want to jump back to the time frame right as soon as the Costa Concordia was beginning to drift towards the island. So roughly 10 to 10.05 p.m. You see, right around this time, there was one other thing that was going on. The harbor at the island of Julio noticed the strange behavior of the Costa Concordia and actually radioed the ship and asked them, hey, what's going on? Do you need help? And of course, Captain Scatino said, no, we're just experiencing a blackout. However, the harbor continued to observe the ship. And as the Costa Concordia was beginning to drift around and do all these strange maneuvers and was beginning to be pushed back towards the island of Julio, they were getting more and more suspicious. Another vessel that was in the area actually attempted to contact the Costa Concordia and ask them if they needed help, at which they received no response. And at roughly one hour or so after the collision, the port authorities were finally told of the situation on board the Costa Concordia. And it was also at this point that emergency personnel were starting to be alerted, like the Coast Guard and stuff like that. Honestly, this was sheer negligence in part of the ship's crew. And yes, I do blame the captain for this, but honestly, the ship's officers on board should have also taken steps to let people know what was going on when they saw the behavior of the captain. I mean, I know that's easy for me to say at this point looking back, but still, if I would have been on the bridge that night and I would have seen what's been going on, I would have taken steps to let somebody know, hey, the Costa Concordia is in trouble and we need to start doing something to get these passengers and crew off of this ship before it sinks. Now, remember earlier in this video how I talked about how the Costa Concordia was beginning to list a port because she struck the rock on the port side? Well, as the wind was beginning to push the Concordia back towards land, the listing of the ship changed a bit. You see, the ship at this point began listing not to port, but she actually started leaning to starboard. So that meant the ship righted itself and then started leaning in the opposite direction. So how could this happen? My first thought would be maybe the wind actually ended up pushing the ship more to starboard, but that didn't really make a lot of sense to me because with how heavy water is and how big of a ship this was, how strong would the wind have to blow in order to cause a big shift in the listing of a ship like this? Well, I did a little bit of research, and the wind was partially responsible. However, there was also another culprit that caused the Concordia to begin listing to starboard. Now, in order to properly explain why the Costa Concordia began to develop a list to starboard, let's turn to the closest model I have that actually looks like the Costa Concordia, my Carnival ship. And it's a new model. You guys haven't seen this one before. So, I guess it does make sense that the Costa Concordia and the Carnival ship would look alike since they were both owned by the same company, but whatever. So, as we all know, that as the Costa Concordia was sailing along, it struck a rock on the port side and the ship began listing to port. This makes sense. However, the reason the ship began listing to starboard is a little bit complicated. So, initially, not too long after the ship hit the rock and began listing to port and the port side compartments of the vessel began to flood, Essentially what they do now when they're building modern day vessels is they design these ships if they're going to sink and going to start flooding. They design the compartments of these ships to do what's called cross flooding, meaning the compartments inside a vessel will allow the water to move from the port side of the ship where the ship is flooding and head over to the starboard side in an effort to bring the ship back on an even keel. And the reason they do this is to try to fight the whole ship's listing and sinking to one side. And honestly, this makes perfect sense because what good is it to have enough lifeboats on a vessel if a ship is going to begin to sink and list in one direction so much that you can't launch half of the lifeboats? Makes perfect sense. So this system was on board the Costa Concordia and it was working very well. So the Costa Concordia hit the rock, the ship began listing to port, then the cross flooding system kicked in and brought the ship back on an even keel. So if there were no other factors in this, the ship would have just sunk very evenly and straight down, giving the crew the opportunity to launch all the lifeboats from the ship before she sank. Now it's debatable if they would have had enough time to do so. I'm not really sure. It all has to do with how the flooding was proceeding. But still, now you get the idea of the whole cross flooding thing and it makes perfect sense. But things would actually change on the Concordia. Remember that very strong wind that I was talking about that was beginning to push the ship back towards the island of Julio? Well, it did play a factor. So as the ship was sitting perfectly level and beginning to do that crazy drift maneuver you saw earlier that would inevitably push it back towards the island, the wind ended up giving the ship just the slightest, slightest, slightest little list to starboard. Because And then it ended up pushing the water to the starboard side. Just a little. I'm talking very, very small. 
And then as the ship began to be pushed closer and closer toward the island of Julia and start drifting back, when the ship, just pretend that my hand here is the shoreline of the island of Julia, when the ship came up and the bottom of the ship hit land or hit the rock underneath the ocean, this put even more strain on the ship and caused it to lean even further to starboard. So the water is already on the starboard side due to the wind, the ship makes contact with the land, and then it even pushes the ship further to starboard, thus causing the ship to begin to capsize in the starboard direction. I hope I explained this pretty clearly. It's pretty complicated and it's kind of hard to follow. But yeah, this is the main reason why the Costa Concordia ended up listing to starboard, even though she did hit the rock on the port side. In the end, the Costa Concordia would end up beaching itself just off the coast of the island of Julio. However, the water was deep enough where the vessel came to rest that they could actually begin to launch the Costa Concordia's lifeboats on the ship's starboard side. The list of the ship became so great that it became impossible to launch any of the lifeboats on the port side of the Costa Concordia, and this would inevitably have a major impact on the evacuation of the ship. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I think I'm going to wrap up the video here. And you know, it's funny. When I started making this video on the Costa Concordia, I had no intention of this being a two-part series. But the more I started doing this video, the more I started researching it, I'm like, yeah, this is going to need to be a two-parter. In order to accurately explain the entire story of the Costa Concordia, I can't do it in a 10, 15, 20-minute video. I want you guys to have the most complete picture as to what happened to this ship as possible. So yeah, it's going to need to be a two-parter. Anyway, guys, hey, thank you all so much for being here, and hey, stay tuned for the next episode. The next episode on the Historic Travels channel will be The Sinking of the Costa Concordia, Part 2. All right, everybody. Well, hey, y'all keep doing what you do. Be sure to like, subscribe, leave any comments, leave any thoughts you have on this video down below. And guys, keep doing what you do. You guys are awesome. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I'll see you in the next one. Have a good night, everybody. And thank you all so much for being here.